What's up, short attention span history nerds? My name is Mike Perry, and you're watching 10 Minute History. Today's subject is about the United States military. Now, I've never served in the military, but I have been in battle, three battles to be exact. Call of Duty, Call of Duty 2, and Star Wars Battlefront 2. The latter one really scarred me. But enough about my time in country and space. Let's get on to the reason why you clicked on this video. Badass women. Women are awesome. So awesome I married one. Now it's taken a long time to get to the point where we don't place women in an unfair box and demand that they stay there. One instance where women demolished the box was as pilots in World War II. Now not combat pilots, that would take a few more decades, but rather flying military aircraft stateside so that the boys could go overseas and fight the axis of evil. WASP, or rather Women Air Force Service Pilots, started out as two separate organizations. Pilot Jacqueline Jackie Cochran wrote to First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt in 1939 to suggest the idea of using women pilots in non-combat missions. Cochran was introduced by Roosevelt to General Henry H. Arnold, Chief of the Army Air Force, and to General Robert Olds, who became the head of the Air Transport Command. Arnold asked her to ferry a bomber to Great Britain in order to generate publicity for the idea of women piloting military aircraft. Cochran flew to England, where she volunteered for the Air Transport Auxiliary and recruited American women pilots to help fly planes to Europe. 25 women volunteered for the ATA with Cochrane. The American women who flew in the ATA were the first American women to fly military aircraft. In the summer of 1941, Cochrane and test pilot Nancy Harkness Love independently submitted proposals to the Army Air Forces to allow women to pilot in non-combat missions after the outbreak of World War II in Europe. The plan was to free male pilots for combat roles by using qualified female pilots to ferry aircraft from the factories to military bases and to also tow drones for aerial targets. The U.S. was building its air power and military presence in anticipation for direct involvement in the conflict and had belatedly begun to drastically expand its men in uniform. This period led to the dramatic increase in activity for the U.S. Army Air Forces because of obvious gaps in manpower that could be filled by women. To compensate for the manpower demands after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the government encouraged women to enter the workforce to fill both industrial and service jobs, supporting the war effort. Nancy Harkness Love's husband, Robert Love, was part of the Army Air Corps Reserves and worked for Colonel William H. Tuner. When Robert Love mentioned that his wife was a pilot, Tuner became interested in whether she knew other women who were pilots. Tuner and Nancy Love met and began to plan an aviation ferrying program involving women pilots on June 11, 1942. Colonel Tuner suggested putting women pilots into the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. However, there was a technical problem with this suggestion. So it was decided to pursue hiring civilian pilots for the ATC instead. By June 18th, Love had drafted a plan to send to General Harold L. George, who sent the proposal on to General Harold H. Arnold. Eleanor Roosevelt wrote about women working as pilots during the war in her September 1st My Day newspaper column supporting the idea. General George, again, broached the idea with General Arnold, who finally, on September 5th, directed that immediate action be taken and the recruiting of women pilots begin within 24 hours." End quote. Nancy Harkness Love was to be the director of the group, and she sent out 83 telegrams to prospective women pilots that same day. The Women's Auxiliary Ferrying Squadron went into operation publicly on September 10th, 1942. Cochran returned from England and arrived in the United States the day before the announcement of the WAFS. She was angry that Love's proposal had been accepted while her own had seemingly been ignored. The next day, Cochran flew to Washington, D.C. and confronted General Arnold about her proposal. 
the WAFS had been formed while General Arnold was out on prolonged medical leave. On September 13th, Arnold sent a memo to General George E. Stratemeyer that designated Cochrane as the Director of Women's Flying Training. And on September 15, 1942, Cochrane's training proposal was also adopted, forming the 319th Women's Flying Training Detachment. The WFTD would be working with the Flight Training Command. WFTD was conceived of a program to train more women to ferry aircraft. On October 7th, General Arnold proposed the goal of training 500 women pilots. By November 3rd, General Arnold was proposing a maximum effort to train women pilots. Cochrane pushed aggressively for a single entity to control the activity of all pilots. Tuner in particular objected on the basis of differing qualification standards and the absolute necessity of the ATC being allowed to control its own pilot. But Cochrane's preeminence with Arnold prevailed and in July 1943 he ordered that the program merge with Cochrane as director. The WAFS and the WFTD were combined to form the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, or WASP. Love continued with the program as executive in charge of WASP ferrying operations. The formal announcement combining WAFS and WFTD took place on August 20th, 1943. WASP adopted a patch in 1943 that featured a female gremlin. The gremlin was conceived by Roland Dahl and drawn by Walt Disney himself and became the official WASP mascot. Now, nothing says badass women pilots like Walt Disney. At least it was a gremlin and not Sleeping Beauty or Bambi. More than 1,100 young women, all civilian volunteer pilots, flew almost every type of military aircraft, including the B-26 and B-29 bombers, as part of the WASP program. They ferried new planes long distances from factories to military bases and departure points across the country. They tested newly overhauled planes and they towed targets to give ground and air gunners something to shoot at with live ammunition. That's badass. The WASP expected to become part of the military during their service. Instead, the program was canceled after just two years. They weren't granted military status until the 1970s, and it wasn't until President Obama signed a bill awarding the WASP the Congressional Gold Medal that these ladies finally received the recognition that they deserved. Margaret Fellon Taylor grew up on a farm in Iowa. She was 19, she had just completed two years of college and was ready for adventure in 1943 when a Life magazine cover story on the female pilots caught her eye. Her brother was training to be a pilot with the Army, so why not her? She asked her father to lend her money for a pilot's license. I told him that I had to do it, Taylor says, and so he let me have the money. And I don't think I ever paid him back either. But there was a problem. She was half an inch shorter than the required 5'2 requirement. I just stood on my tippy toes, she said. When she arrived at the Avengers Field in Sweetwater, Texas, where most of the wasps were trained, well, there were a lot of other short ones just like me, and we laughed about how we got in. Short, tall, slim, wide, they all came in knowing how to fly. The military trained their male pilots from scratch, but not the female civilian volunteers. They didn't want to bring in a bunch of girls who didn't know how to fly an airplane, says Catherine Sharp Landick, associate professor of history at Texas Women's University who's writing a book about the WASP, tentatively called Against Prevailing Winds, the Women Air Force Service Pilots and American Society. So you have women who are getting out of high school and taking every dime that they have to learn how to fly so that they can become a WASP. Once when Taylor was ferrying an aircraft across country, somewhere between Arizona and California, she saw smoke coming out of the cockpit. Taylor was trained to bail out immediately if anything went wrong. But the parachutes were way too big. They weren't fitted for us, she said. The force of the air and the speed that we were going and everything, well, that would have just ripped it off of us. You'd slip right out. So her plane was filling with smoke and Taylor was facing a defining moment. I thought, you know what? I'm not gonna bail until I see flames. When I actually see fire, then I'll jump. Was she scared? No, I was never scared. My husband used to say, 
pretty hard to scare you. Fortunately, the plane's problem turned out to be a burned out instrument. Unfortunately, 38 female pilots did lose their lives serving their country. One was 26-year-old Mabel Rawlinson from Kalamazoo, Michigan. I've always known of her as the family hero, says Rawlinson's niece, Pam Poli, who never knew her aunt. The one we lost too soon, the one that everyone loved and wished was still around. Rawlinson was stationed at Camp Davis in North Carolina. She was coming back from a night training exercise with her male instructor when the plane crashed. Marion Hanrahan, also a wasp at Camp Davis, wrote an eyewitness account. I knew Mabel very well and we were both scheduled to check out on night flight in an A24. My time preceded her, but she offered to go first because I hadn't had dinner yet. We were in the dining room and we heard the siren that indicated a crash. We ran out onto the field. We saw that the front of the plane was engulfed in flames and we could hear Mabel screaming. It was a nightmare. It's believed that Rawlinson's hatch malfunctioned and she couldn't get out. The other pilot was thrown from the plane and suffered serious injuries. Because Rawlinson was a civilian, the military was not required to pay for her funeral or pay for her remains to be sent back home. So, and this is a common story, her fellow pilots pitched in. They collected enough money to ship her remains home by train, says Polly, and a couple of her fellow wasps accompanied her casket. And because Rawlinson wasn't considered military, the American flag could not be draped over her coffin. Her family did it anyways. In 1944, historian Landick says, the program came under threat. It was a very controversial time for women flying aircraft. There was a debate about whether they were needed any longer, Landick says. By the summer of 1944, the war seemed to be winding down. Flight training programs were closing down, which meant that male civilian instructors were losing their jobs. Fearing the draft and being put into the ground army, they lobbied for the women's jobs. Cowards. It was unacceptable to have a woman replacing men. They could release men for duty that was patriotic, but they couldn't replace men, Landick says. And so General Arnold announced the program would disband by December 1944 but those who were still in training could finish. The lost last class, as it was dubbed, graduated, but served only two and a half weeks before being sent home on December 20th, along with all the other wasps. Lillian Yonnelly served her country for more than a year as a wasp. When she was dismissed from her base in California, there was no ceremony, not a damn thing. It was told to us that we'd be leaving base and we hopped airplanes to get back home. Home for Yonnelly, was across the country in Massachusetts. That was a familiar story, but Landick says there were some bases that did throw parties or had full reviews for the departing wasp. The women left and went on with their lives. A few of them got piloting jobs after the war, but not with any major airlines. And some of them stayed on as what was known at the time as airline stewardesses. In those days, no major commercial airline would hire these experienced women as pilots. Like many in World War II veterans, most WASP never talked about their experiences. And according to Taylor, they never expected anything either. It was root hog or die. You had to take care of yourself. Nobody owed us anything, she says. The WASP kept in touch for a while. They even formed a reunion group after the war, but that didn't last long. Then in the 1960s, they began to find each other again. They had reunions, they started talking about pushing for military status, and then something happened in 1976 that riled the entire WASP's nest. The Air Force comes out and says that they are going to start admitting women into their flying programs, Landick says. An Air Force statement says it's the first time that the Air Force has allowed women to fly their aircraft. 30 years later, that comment still upsets former Wash Yonley. It was impossible for anyone to say that, she said. That just simply wasn't true. We were the first ones. The fact that the WASPs were forgotten by their own Air Force united the women. They lobbied Congress to be militarized, and they persuaded Senator Barry Goldwater to help. He ferried planes during the war, just as the WASP did. And then in 1977, the WASP were finally granted military status. 
Over the years, it's been reported that the WASP's records were sealed, stamped, classified, and unavailable to historians who wrote about history of World War II. According to archivists at the National Archives, military records containing reports about the WASPs were treated no differently from any other records, which generally meant that the WASP records weren't open to researchers for 30 years. But unlike other stories from the war, the WASP stories were rarely told or reported until the 1970s. It's hard to understand that they would be forgotten and difficult to believe that they would be left out of history, Landick says. In 1992, to preserve their history, the WASP dedicated Texas Women's University in Denton as their official archives. Donnelly is proud to be honored with the Congressional Gold Medal, 65 years after her service, but she's sad that fewer than 300 of her 1,100 fellow WASPs are alive to receive it. I'm sorry that so many girls have passed on. It's nice that their families will receive it, but it doesn't make up for the gals who knew what they did and weren't honored that way, Yonley says. Taylor's also excited about the medal. She served her country out of loyalty, she says. That was certainly part of it. But the other reason, I was a young girl and everyone had left and it was wartime. You didn't want to get stuck in a hole in Iowa. You wanted to see what was going on. And that's the story of America's first female Army Air Force pilots that you never knew about. It's a shame that it's taken so long to give women the opportunity to prove themselves fit for military service. And these women in particular deserved recognition for their valor well before 1976. If you like short history videos with a little sarcasm and humor, consider subscribing to 10 Minute History. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And don't miss a single upload. Click on that bell. Also check out some of my other videos. Until next time. According to archivists at the National Archives Military, that's not what it says. Fit for military service, that's not what I said.